Welcome back to the Menopause Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Gordon. If you're watching the replay or on YouTube, thanks so much for being a part of the Menopause Movement. Today, we welcome Dr. John Carazella as the first male guest on our podcast. Now, Dr. John is a former orthopedist who became a hormone and metabolic specialist when his ex-wife descended into mental misery. He sought out a treatment, and when he found it, he made it his mission to help as many people as he could with their hormone problems. Now, Dr. Carazella is a 1978 honors graduate from Yale. He subsequently earned his MD from the University of Cincinnati in 1982 with the honor of Alpha Omega Alpha. He completed his orthopedic surgical residency and hand surgery fellowship in 1988. And after practicing as an orthopedic surgeon for 25 years, he switched his focus to the non-traditional medical specialties of hormone replacement, sexual health and dysfunction, and age management. Now, over the years, he has been a member of a number of medical associations, which have included the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, the American Society for Surgery of the Hand, and the American College of Surgeons. And now in 2014, Dr. Carazella became an advanced fellow of the American Academy of Anti-Aging and Aesthetic Medicine, a member of the International Society for Sexual Medicine and the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. In August 2016, Dr. Carazella was awarded a master's degree in metabolic and nutritional medicine from the University of South Florida. He became a diplomat of the American Board of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine in 2013, and he carries a certificate in sexual medicine from the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, a certificate in advanced endocrinology from the University of South Florida, and a certificate in advanced bioidentical hormone therapy from WorldLink Medical. He is an expert in hormone therapy, sexual dysfunction, and age management for both men and women. Dr. Carazella currently practices in Orlando, Florida, where he devotes his practice to serving the needs of patients with hormonal deficiencies, sexual dysfunction, incontinence, nutritional imbalances, and age management issues. During the podcast, we talk about how he got from orthopedics to hormones. The difficulties involved with practicing medicine in America now, especially as a private practitioner who must interact with insurance companies, treating people, not lab numbers, the signs and symptoms of low testosterone in men and where to go for help, menopause and weight. Now stay to the end to find out what he does for sexual rejuvenation in women, how he does it and the results he sees. At the end of the episode, make sure you visit drmichellegordon.com slash podcasts where you can find the show notes plus the links to the books and resources mentioned in the episode. And if you enjoy the episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you are always the first to know when each episode is released. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you for all of the five-star reviews. And if you haven't left a review yet, please take the time to review the podcast with written review. This helps more women find it and get the help they need during the disruption of menopause. No one should have to go it alone. We found that out with the Minomates for sure. And I'm joined by Dr. John Carazola, Carazella. John Carazella. You got it. Yep. Yeah, awesome. So what I find fascinating about you and, and the reason I wanted it, first of all, you're the first man to be on the Menopause Movement podcast. So oh, wow, congratulations. That's, I'm honored. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is that when I read your, you know, your brief bio, you, you, know, you told us that you were an orthopedic surgeon. And so I just, I want to know the story of how you went from orthopedic surgeon to women's sexuality and hormone expert, because this is, I mean, orthopods are very different. I'm a surgeon, right? I'm a general surgeon. And how we look at, you know, this is kind of funny. We make fun of you guys, right? So that we look at the orthopedists as, you know, the kind of the mechanics, you know, they fix the bones and that sort of thing. It's like, you got to be the smartest guy in medical school to get into the orthopedic fellowship. You have to be the highest on the test to get into the orthopedic residency, whatever. And then as soon as you guys graduate residency, you forget it all. <laughs> and <laughs> there is a fracture. I have to fix it. And that's it. <laughs> so, 
and I mean that all tongue in cheek. It's not like you guys aren't smart, but it's it's just it's really interesting that that all of the critical care, all that stuff, just kind of goes out the window, and it's just basically, you know, you become a carpenter. So, so let's let's hear your story. I'd love to hear yeah, it. Well, you you kind of have it right. I mean, I went to the University of Cincinnati, and I was you know ninety fifth percentile on my boards, and I was the number one choice of my orthopedic residency. And matter of fact. There were several that wanted me. I, was, I looked strongly at San Francisco and a couple of others, uh, but I stayed in Cincinnati because that's where they wanted me. And I was 95th percentile in my in trainings and, you know, just really did very well in everything that I did. Went out and practiced general orthopedics largely for 25 years, although I did have a, a fellowship in hand surgery. And I was like the first Peter Stern came to me way back when, and he was he ultimately went on to develop one of the top hand surgery fellowships in the country. And he asked me to be his kickoff fellow because of my credentials. So yes, I, I did do pretty well over time, but I ended up practicing general orthopedics for about 25 years and really just got tired of a call dealing with insurance companies, the mm. sense of entitlement and really kind of got burnt out like a lot of people do. It almost got to the point where it's physically challenging to go to work every day. Well, at one time, one day shortly, so actually at one point, I actually tried to leave medicine altogether. And while we were going through that transition, my uh, ex-wife went through a rather dramatic menopause. And so we ran around, you know, the neighborhood and went to all these doctors and we got the usual stuff, which I'm sure, given the title of your uh, blog and website, you have heard the story a million times. Yeah. Get over it. That's the way it is. Put your big girl panties on. This is what life is don't do that. It's going to cause cancer and on and on and on and on and all of the nonsense that you hear out there in traditional medicine regarding menopause and hormones. Well, we finally found a, a couple of people and we went through the creams and a variety of different things and ended up in a pellet office. And it was nothing short of life changing. The dramatic turnaround I saw in her was just nothing short of stunning. Her, her vitality came back, her energy came back, her enthusiasm, her sharpness and uh, my ex was an incredibly brilliant and and sharp lady and when when that went away and came back it was really kind of spectacular uh, to see it related to the hormones and you know i got interested and so i got approached by a uh, a pellet company to do what i call a weekend warrior kind of stuff where you went to a one-day training and uh, learned how to put the pellets in and after a bit i started doing it and i started seeing for myself this dramatic turnaround over and over and over again, but I had a problem with the way that they were teaching it. You know, I would do it, and of course, like anything else, 80% of the people would get better and 20% would have challenges or whatever. And my supervisors at the time said, well, just give more. Well, I had a problem with that. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to start to understand uh, more of the physiology and all of the biochemistry. And with my history of being really highly intellectual and all this stuff, being a one-day wonder wasn't good enough for me. So I eventually found the American Academy of Anti-Aging and Aesthetic Medicine uh, and went on to the University of South Florida and got a master's degree in, in nutritional and metabolic medicine. You know, ultimately got a certificate in advanced metabolic endocrinology and started doing all of the things that I couldn't stand in medical school, that is physiology and biochemistry and endocrinology, and actually fell in love with it. I have gone on to really become somewhat of an expert in this field. I mentor with a internationally renowned expert named Neil Rousier, who teaches at an exceptionally high level. And all we do is evidence-based medicine. And everything that I preach in my office, everything that I do is right out of the literature using parameters that you can find in everyday literature and the endocrinology literature, maturitas, and you pretty much name it, and I've got references in my library to show that what I do is evidence-based. I really believe in evidence-based medicine. I, I don't want to do anything that's, you know, that's crazy or weird. Of course, sometimes with some of the sexual rejuvenation stuff that's so cutting edge these days, there's not a lot of big literature on it, but uh, I pretty much try to stay in the literature and stay in command of the literature and uh, be able to defend pretty much anything that I do these days. So it's fun and it's exciting. It's definitely life-changing, not only for myself, but truly for my clients and my patients and the people who come to see me. And it is far more fun than fixing a broken arm, I can tell you that. <laughs> so where are you located? 
I'm located in Orlando, Florida, and Orlando. Uh, very known as Restaurant Row. We're right near International Drive, where all of the tourists go, and right near Bay Hill and Windermere, some of the nicer stuff. Not sections. right now. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me about it. Yeah, there's there's nobody coming now. So I wanted to talk. Let me just go back and let's let's talk a little bit. When did you leave traditional medicine and dealing with insurance companies? Yeah, sure. How long ago my was my last orthopedic case was on January first of 2010. Okay. I spent about a year and a half outside of medicine looking at other interests and you know, God made it very clear to me that my calling was a physician. And when he yeah. put this hormone challenge in front of me, I was really excited to pick it up and run with it. And it's, it's been totally revolutionary and life changing for me, as I said. Yeah, sure. So back then in 2010, I mean, insurance companies were paying a little bit more than they do now. And so what we found, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know if you've seen this, but, you know, my practice is in the process of trying to recoup funds from 2015 oh my you know, and, and up, yeah. right? And so, you know, what, what a lot of people don't understand in the medical field in America, the broken system that we have is that, you know, you come into the hospital, say, with a problem or you come to the office with a problem. So you have a, you know, a broken arm for you, a gallbladder for me, and we schedule that and we do it. And then the insurance company says, if you have a contract with them, they say, okay, this is what we're going to pay you. And then they often pay you less. And the way that Duck Vong said it on the, the thing I had with him was like, it's like going out and having two or $300 dinner and then tell, you know, leaving after you've, after you've had that dinner and then, then coming back and saying, well, I'm only going to pay you a hundred dollars for that. And it's a similar, it's a similar thing, except for, you know, the insurance companies at the end of the day, all they want to do is just not, not pay. And so we have, you know, so many people that are, that are just dedicated to making sure that the insurance companies do what they're contracted to do. And then if you're not in network, then they make it really, really hard to get paid and they send checks to patients and then patients will steal the money thinking that it's, since it's made out to them, it should be theirs. And then you have to sue patients to get the money back, and that makes us look bad. And so there's a lot of misinformation out there, especially when it comes to out-of-network. And the reason why people are out-of-network, doctors are out-of-network, is because insurance companies won't contract with the little guys for a decent amount of money. And so if you only have one doctor or two doctors or three doctors in your practice, and you're only covering a certain number of lives, the insurance companies have the power to say, well, we're only going to pay you 50% of what Medicare pays and, and there's a zero control. And so I just don't think that the public really understands how difficult it is to be an independent doctor. And then with all the MBAs who've come into medicine with all the merges that have happened and the big bloat in administration, it has ruined healthcare and that has become so evident in this coronavirus pandemic in America and the fact that we're having trouble getting PPE and we're having trouble, you know, making, making sure that, that people are, are actually coming to work at the front lines and then they're paying nurses more than they pay doctors. So, it, so this isn't just trying to get into a political argument about this, but it's more that, you know, we've got a broken system and, and co COVID has really proven how broken it is. And so I, I'm hoping that we'll fix it. But you did say something about entitlement. And when you say that, do you mean entitlement by the insurance companies or entitlement by patients? Well, I, I mean actually by both. But, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of like this. Okay, I remember back, uh, you know, several years ago when I had a patient come in and, you know, he had chopped off the tip of his thumb or something. And I took him to the emergency room and fixed him up. And he came in a couple of weeks later and he said, Doc, he said, I, I can't thank you enough. He says, I don't have any money. I can't pay you. But you know what? You, you made it so I could go back to work and take care of my family. Nothing better than that. I could care less if I got paid from somebody like that, okay? But the entitlement that, that you get is someone, you know, a guy comes in at, uh, I remember a case, a guy came in at 2 o'clock in the morning. He was drinking. He decided to mow the lawn. He slipped his foot under the lawnmower, and so I had to go in and clean it up. And and the guy came in, and you know, and he he says, well, he says, so, you know, you just you had you were on call, you had to do that, and 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 he just approaches it like totally with no no thankfulness or whatever, even, even though he can't, you know, pay. You know, it's like, well, I expected that. That's what you're supposed to do. You make too much money anyway. And, right. and you know, with kind of touching a little bit on what you said uh, before, with people not understanding what's involved and 
you know, the, the delivery of medical care and the reimbursement. So you just got that sense of entitlement from some people that, that came in, did, couldn't pay, weren't going to pay, and couldn't even express some appreciation. Right. You know, it's like, I, I'm, I'm totally generous. And if someone just acknowledges that, you know, I did something nice for them, you know, I'll work with them or write it off or whatever. It's just, it, it got too often. And then the same thing you said about the checks when I've had that happen when I used to take insurance, the checks would go to the patient and you knew they cashed it. And then you go, well, where'd the money go? And they go, same thing you said. And now here you are suing them. And you go, goodness gracious, didn't you know that's not yours? It was supposed to come to me for taking care. Right. So yeah. kind of things. And then, you know, that, that insurance company hassle is just, it's just so nice not to be dealing with that anymore. Right. I know I completely agree with you. And, and the, the way we've been handcuffed in terms of HIPAA and in terms of, you know, uh, just not being able to, you know, do normal business, you know, with the star, with what happened in the eighties with the star clause and things like that. And so I think that there's, there's a big change that's going to come out of this COVID crisis, but I don't know that I will survive medicine to see its benefits, but the younger people may. And, you know, we, we, we see these, you know, where we, where we consolidate and then we break up and we consolidate and then we break up. I mean, this is just the natural order of a, of a capitalistic society. And so, you know, at the, at the end of the day, as long as people get a care, I think it's good. But the problem, the problem I think in terms of entitlement comes from, you know, when pain control became a right, you know, and that's when the opioid crisis got started. And, and then hospitals treating patients as if they're in a, in a hotel. And people thinking that, you know, in America, when they come to the hospital, that that it's all about the way that we serve them instead of the fact that they're sick and we're taking care of them and we want them to get out so that they can go home and, and live their lives. So there's there's a lot of issues there. And, and this is probably pretty polarizing. So we can move on to uh, talking about hormone pellets. <laughs> Absolutely. So how did you, how did you get, so you you say that you, you took this one day course and you started doing hormone pellets and you tried it on your ex-wife and she had a dramatic change. So what, you know, what's the process? How do you administer? How do you decide what's, you know, what kind of lab tests do you do? That sort of thing. Sure. Well, you know, the, the thing about hormone therapy and particularly in menopause is, you know, when people are in menopause. Okay. I mean, you just know, I mean, they're, in the United States, age 51 is the average age of onset of menopause, and it's defined by 12 months without a menstrual cycle, and it's usually accompanied by a pretty standard constellation of symptoms. And uh, I, I like to tell people I don't treat lab tests, I treat people, okay? And the reality is, is when you see that 51-year-old woman who fits that description, you know they're not making estrogen, uh, more precisely estradiol, you know they're not making progesterone. You know that they're not making uh, testosterone and more than likely they have a significant degree of thyroid resistance or some kind of thyroid imbalance uh, regardless. And so, you know, I know exactly what the plans are going to be based upon the uh, way they present. And I think it's really important to, to point out that, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember Marcus Welby and for your younger listeners. I remember that, I remember yeah. Marcus Welby. You know, I don't ever remember in an episode of Marcus Welby when he looked down and said, the lab test says I need to do this. He right. never did that. And the first day I went to medical school, they said to me, they said, ask the patient what's wrong with them and they will tell you. And that's kind of the way that I run my practice. You know, I learn about these syndromes and these complexes of uh, symptoms that lead to a particular diagnosis. And then I treat that diagnosis and I use the labs as confirmation. So what we'll often do is, you know, we get the baseline levels and I'll go over them and I'll pretty much explain that they're standard, but I want to come back to the hormone levels very specifically because we need to understand that very clearly. So I'll pretty much be able to understand and, and recommend a treatment plan based upon just the story. Now we do get the baseline levels because I want to know that we started at one point and we got to another point. And I want to show that we advanced or changed the level of those hormones and then at the end of the day, the blood level is more important in telling me where that patient feels balanced rather than having that number be the destination. Let's take testosterone, for example, because that's, that's really poorly understood. I'll first describe it in men, and then I will talk about it more uh, specifically in women. You know, the standard range for testosterone in men is about 250 to about 1,100. 
And even that is changing because when we define normal, it's a statistical collection of numbers where they just create a mean and then go two standard deviations out. And that, that normal has actually been lowering over the last 50 years because the herd testosterone levels in men have been falling for a variety of reasons that I think are beyond the discussion for today. But the reaction, the labs have been lowering that upper level of testosterone when there's tons of literature out there to suggest that men perform more poorly at lower levels of testosterone and are more prone to the diseases of aging at lower levels, okay? So what we do is we define this normal range, and yet we find that when we administer testosterone as a supplement, which we often have to call it when you're giving it to them in, a, in the normal range, that is, we're not treating low testosterone. Low testosterone in men is defined as two separate measurements of testosterone drawn before 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, accompanied by the symptoms of low testosterone. So that's the only conditions in which you can make that diagnosis. And I'd say that 90% of the men that I treat don't have a diagnosis of low testosterone, yet they have a symptom complex that responds dramatically when you use testosterone off-label as a supplement to improve the symptoms. And you can go to the literature over and over again, find out that men that are below 900 have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's disease, and that as you go down in those numbers, all kind of things from erectile dysfunction to mental clarity to dementia, type 2 diabetes, all of these go up in incidence. And when you use testosterone in those situations, they get better. So let me just ask you a question really quick. For the, for the women who are looking to maybe help their husbands, okay, or their, or their partner who is a man, what do they want to look for for a man who has low testosterone or, or the symptoms of low testosterone that might need some supplementation? Oh, absolutely. Very, very simple. They have low energy, fatigue. The couch calls their name at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They feel like they're losing it at work or in the boardroom or in the, the executives are falling behind the younger guys. They're taking two to three days to recover from their workouts instead of one or two. Their, end, their strength is decreasing. Their muscles are wasting. They're getting visceral fat buildup, particularly around the abdomen. Uh, their sexual function declines. Uh, their ability to achieve erections and orgasm goes down. And so they're just a whole constellation of things. Just a guy that feels like he's turning into the grumpy old man. That's, that's kind of the way we describe it. Hmm. For for a man who is looking for some help, I mean, who's not in the Orlando area, can they go to the urologist or do they, where do they go to get some help? Yeah, you really got to be careful because way too many doctors are looking at those normal ranges and you get guys come in with all of the typical symptoms in a testosterone level of four or 500 and they're going to say, no, you don't qualify. Well, technically they don't because they don't have that diagnosis. So you really need to go to somebody who actually specializes in hormones that understands the application of hormones to the degree where you're looking at an optimal result, not a normal result. Because a normal 60-year-old guy is going to be run down, cranky, forgetful, have poor erectile function and that. That's not what I want. I don't want to be normal. I want to be optimal. That means taking the levels a little bit higher. And particularly when you talk about women and testosterone, they have a lot of the same type of symptoms. Their libidos go down. Their interest in life goes down. Their sexual function goes down. With women, that normal range may be, say, from zero to 50. But we find that where women respond the best to testosterone is when you take those levels up to 100, 150, 250, or even higher. Okay? And when you look at work by a breast surgeon in Dayton, Ohio, with uh, results uh, published in Maturitas, she shows that uh, Rebecca Glazer is her name. I don't know if you've ever heard her name. No. Uh, she shows that the higher the level of testosterone, and that is testosterone levels in women over 400, which are almost astronomical if you think about it in terms of an absolute number, yet you can reduce the risk of breast cancer by over 75% in her series. And her series has been validated in other centers in the United States and in Australia. So this is valid medicine that shows that testosterone is a phenomenal a substance for women, and yet the FDA doesn't even recognize it as a substance that's available to women in the United States. Well, you can get it in, you know, bioidentical form. You can, but it's off-label. I mean, and, yeah. you know, like I say, there's no FDA, there used to be FDA-approved uh, compounds, not compounds as compounded medicine, but FDA-approved substances 
for women, but they were withdrawn from the market several years ago, and particularly after the so-called cardiac scare in their testosterone in men, which is just a bunch of baloney as far as I'm concerned. Well, the other thing is, is that the physiology of women is very different from the physiology of men. And the biggest beef I have with the medical community is that they never did any studies on women until Absolutely. recently. Absolutely. And so, especially when it comes to heart disease. And so the medical community just decided that, you know, we only have to test men and that is just typical, you know, patriarchal thought. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You look at a medicine out there, the, um, uh, Flabanserin, which is a, a trade name Addy for women. And the history of that substance is just horrendous. It, it costs more than twice the amount to bring a drug to market than almost any other drug. It had been up for phase three trials on several occasions, and the FDA shot it down. And the final thing that was just absolutely ridiculous is when it was finally approved, it had a black box warning on it, and it had a, a REMS warning, which you actually had to counsel a woman against drinking alcohol, and they had to sign a waiver saying that they wouldn't take it, wouldn't take alcohol when they use this medication. What does Addy do? It's a libido enhancer, okay? And so the hang-up with the FDA was, is they said, well, when you're talking libido and sexually oriented drugs, we need to know the interaction with alcohol because sex and alcohol goes together. And so they set out parameters for the alcohol measurement in women, and it turned out that they could not get a study where they could get enough alcohol into women to test the drug adequately with numbers enough. So what they did is they turned around and they went to men, gave it to men. They could get to alcohol levels in their blood that made the test valid. And they found out when they did it in men that they were having episodes of forgetfulness and amnesia and syncope. So they put a black box warning around the women's dose, even though they could never get them to drink enough alcohol to induce the symptoms that the men wow. were Do you want to talk about a patriarchal process? You got it right there. And it's just amazing that they went through that. They finally, I believe just recently, they removed that black box warning, which is almost unheard of. But it's just incredible what Addy went through to get to market. That's crazy. So do you subscribe? Do you prescribe that, the Addy? I do from time to time, but it's again, it's it's extremely expensive, and I can do a lot better with testosterone, which is cheaper and more customizable. So sure. I, I like being able to have things in my toolbox that I can tailor to a particular person's needs, and I get really, really good response with testosterone in women. You know, they'll be in a kit. I'd say maybe one in fifty are interested. Well, can I do this with an FDA approved thing? I go, okay, here. Or even sometimes I've had women that are having trouble getting that sexual response with testosterone alone, and I've used it as a second line for that. And so mm -hmm. it's useful, but it, it's expensive. And like I said, I can do better with yeah. testosterone for the most part. You know, I mean, menopause symptoms are huge. And, and, you know, people complain about hot flashes and mood swings and just, you know, overall feeling of low, low mood and that sort of thing. But one of the biggest complaints that women have is weight gain and not recognizing themselves anymore. And the weight just starts to pile on. I'm starting to look pregnant. I don't understand what's going on and why is all this weight coming? And, and that's, that's one of the biggest, biggest things. And so what has been your res re results when it comes to weight loss for these oh, women that you're using? Yeah, that, that is huge. I mean, a, a day, one day does not go by when we're, we're dealing with weight by multiple of my patients, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's very clear, but you see, my belief, I'm an advocate of uh, Jeffrey Fung, uh, who's uh, uh, written some really good stuff on this. I'm a true believer that the reason why people gain weight is because their insulin and sugar metabolism gets out of whack. And that in order for that insulin and sugar metabolism axis to work properly, we must be balanced in our other hormones, that is testosterone, estradiol, and thyroid. And there's tons of literature that shows that interaction with those. And that's why you see a lot of women say, you know, doctor, I, I turned 45 and all of a sudden I started gaining weight and I didn't change my exercise routine. I right. didn't change the way that I eat. What's happening is the way that they're handling the carbohydrates that their body used to be accustomed to dealing with, they can no longer handle those carbohydrates in the same way. And so what happens is we start to deal, get what, well, what's called insulin resistance, but it's really not. It's really sugar excess. That excess of sugar relative to what our body's capability is starts to exceed our body's ability to metabolize it, and we end up storing all of that sugar. It goes through the triglycerides, and then it goes to fats. 
So what I'm very clear to tell patients in my office is hormones are not a weight loss program, but hormones done properly can restore your body's natural physiology so that when you do the things that are necessary to lose the weight, you can lose the weight. Because now what you have to do is you have to get your body in an instance when those insulin levels decline and you're able to mobilize that weight. Because the key is, is managing that insulin sugar access to make sure that your insulin drops so that your body's need for energy develops, you can mobilize that, that fat. Because the problem is when you have so-called insulin resistance, you'll get hungry or you'll get whatever, your body will need some energy. And the only place that your body can get energy when your insulin levels are high are by eating. You're not mobilizing. The people that I find in my office that manage their hormones, we optimize their thyroid, we get them on a good protocol, and we get them into a protocol where they're eating two meals a day, 20% carbs, 80% fats and proteins. You have that 16 hours a day where you can really drop those insulin levels down. Those are the people that learn how to mobilize their fat. And, and if you do that and adhere to that, you'll probably get about a 90% effectiveness rate. And those remaining 10% of the people sometimes are going to have problems with chronic inflammation, uh, gut mm-hmm. inflammation, toxicities, or some other type of, metabolic, type of metabolic blockade that's preventing them from losing the weight. So when it gets to the weight loss of age or the weight gain of aging, it's almost always related to hormone imbalance. You got to get those hormones balanced, and then you've got to manage the insulin and sugar metabolism system. I mean, the studies are out there. 99% of the weight loss programs that don't pay attention to insulin metabolism will fail in the long run, and the people will either gain back all or most of their all or more than their weight, and right. then they lost beforehand. So it's well, the- we. We know that diets don't work, right? We know that if you're going to diet, you know, and and once you stop dieting, you're just going to gain weight again. So if you want to lose weight, it's a lifestyle change. You talked about Jason Fung. He wrote The Obesity Code. He's a proponent of intermittent fasting. And for anybody who's listening to this, you can go back and listen to my podcast with Diane Parham which was, talks about today's fasting for uh, or fa- intermittent fasting for today's aging woman where she found that the the way to really help women you know older you know 45 and up or so uh, is the a 20 hour fast and that's that was her result and then also there's a there's another podcast that I did called you know which intermittent fasting method is right for you and that's all about the different types of of intermittent fasting but what I think I think that if somebody doesn't want to take anything so if they don't want to go for you know a little pellet or they don't want to have any you know even a cream one thing that intermittent fasting can do is it can actually balance things out on its own and intermittent fasting is very very powerful and Jason Fung talks a little bit about that but the main thing I think when it comes to fasting is that, you know, when you get off of sugar and you really pay attention to the labels and, and really pull most of your energy from fats and proteins, the clarity that comes is amazing. Yeah, well, I agree. There are many, many of my patients who have gotten off of carbs, you know, gluten to begin with and then carbs as a, as a follow on. They come in and go, I can't believe I could be this clear again truly is uh, remarkable and, and spectacular. But the problem is, of course, uh, hunger. And we're not used to being hungry as a, as a society. You know, we're still in the midst of the greatest nutritional experiment that's ever happened since the 70s, since Ansel Keys. And so, you know, what we have is there's a lot of religious type beliefs around diet. And you know, this works for that person, that works for that person, and nobody really knows. And and it really is culty. There's there's like culty diet, you know, oh, you've got to eat according to your blood type, or you have to eat, you know, according to this guru, or you have to be vegan and eat all this vegan crap that's filled with, you know, vegetable oil. And at the end of the day, I mean, I think when it comes to inflammation, especially inflammation is like really dependent on what we put in our mouths. And Hippocrates said it best, let food be thy medicine, right? Oh, absolutely. It I all mean, starts with food. Yeah, we spend a lot of time looking at food and food sensitivities and the inflammation. And obviously, we all know about the potential impact of food on Hashimoto's. And you know, 90% of Hashimoto's is probably food related. Um, yeah. So we, 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 you know, it's a big deal for sure. 
Have you seen Hashimoto's reverse in your patients when, when you change their diets? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If, if you can identify a, a food trigger and, you know, of course, one of the things we talk about a lot in functional and integrative medicine is these environmental triggers that will activate these autoimmune disorders. If you can identify that trigger and withdraw that trigger, DNA that produces that immune response will fold back upon itself and it will reverse, okay, in, in many cases. Now, I can't say that that's every case you're going to do that because either, A, you may have just a pure autoimmune expression, or you may not have identified that environmental trigger, but you know, you can reverse, and I have seen Hashimoto's reverse by uh, getting people on clean, healthy nutritional programs that exclude their food triggers. And I've also fought, found low dose naltrexone to be relatively helpful as well. So good food counseling, identifying inflammatory foods, removing those food triggers and low dose naltrexone can be an effective prescription for Hashimoto's. What is the most common food trigger that you see with Hashimoto's? Uh, no, without a question, uh, gluten. So you, you, I, I mentioned that 90% of Hashimoto's may be food related. And out of that, 75 to 80% is probably gluten. Well, it's interesting because, you know, in Japan, gluten is protein that's eaten separately. So I think we have to also pay attention to the fact that it's probably American gluten and not necessarily international gluten because of the GMO, you know, all of the ways that we have genetically modified our food source here. For for sure. Uh, You know, a a great reference on this is a book called Wheat Belly, okay? And I'm sure you- Yes, I've heard of Wheat Belly. He goes into into original wheat had like 14 chromosomes in it, okay? Well, the wheat wheat in the United States has got like 50, approaching 50 chromosomes. You know, of course, they wanted to make it shorter and thicker stalks so the wind doesn't blow it over and more fruit at the top. And, you know, while it takes a billion dollars to get a drug through the FDA, the way you get- food through the FDA is you cut off a wheat stalk, you bring it in the FDA, go, here's wheat. And they go, yeah, it looks like wheat, you can sell it. I mean, and that's about what happens. And so the proteins in the gluten that we eat today are so foreign to the human body. That's why we have the reaction. And I've, I've had a patient that could not eat American gluten, but when they would go to Europe and eat European gluten, mm-hmm. which was more tightly restricted, they had no problem with it. So yeah, that's that's better. really a really interesting you know point because when you go to France, I mean everybody eats bread in France. Bread is like life there, and it doesn't affect me the same way when I eat bread there. So you know it's hard it's hard to like go to France and not eat bread or eat a croissant or you know something like that. So it's it's just really very different. But what about like Roundup Ready? I mean we see so much that you know that has has Roundup actually genetically programmed into it. And Roundup is what, glyphosate, right? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. If you go back into the 1970s, what was really bothering the medical community at that point was the rapidly rising rate of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And so Mm -hmm. the curve is ascending at a particular rate. And right around the middle of the 1970s, three things happened. One, GMO wheat that was so-called Roundup Ready, the application of just widespread glyphosate so that they could come in and just spray the wheat fields and the wheat would still grow. And at the same time, we went to a carb heavy nutritional program. It was like a perfect storm. And so we had all of these things came together and all of a sudden this obesity type two diabetes curve that they were trying to modulate goes like this. Instead, the exact opposite happened of what the, what the powers that be were trying to happen. Well, let's remember that, you know, back in the 50s, the the sugar industry quashed all the evidence-based research that said that sugar was responsible for heart disease. And they decided to blame it all on fat because Ansel Keys like made a decision based on his thoughts. I mean, it was a zero, there was zero truth behind it. And and still the cardiologist, the American College of Cardiology still says eat a low-fat diet, even still after all this research that shows that if you have Kate Shanahan, Dr. Kate Shanahan, who wrote a book about nutrition called Deep Nutrition, and I think she's just come out with a a new version of it, but she says nature doesn't make bad fats. So natural, any natural fat is okay. And what what the research has shown is that these natural fats will increase the size of the LDL particles and make them much more fluffy and so that they don't stick. And when they don't stick, you don't get plaques. And when you don't get plaques, you don't have heart disease and you don't have carotid artery disease and you don't need surgery and you don't need stents. And I mean, stents are a whole nother thing that we could talk about. Oh, but you know, I mean, 
I have a whole thing with dairy. I, dairy is the perfect food for a baby cow. But at the same time, it's, it's not horrible because it's a natural fat, but we are still the only species that eats another species milk, which is, you know, I mean, if you're going to cut something out of your diet, probably the first thing to do is cut out wheat from America. But then, you know, the next thing would be, not, you know, manufactured fats and then probably dairy. I, I could still have trouble. I mean, you, you are right on the way that I think and the way I think that the really informed physicians are starting to understand uh, nutrition and weight loss and weight management. And I, I don't call it weight loss. I call it weight management. You know, and I, I, I would rather, yeah. you know, one of the things that I impress upon my patients all of the time is, you know, listen, you know, I want you to be at an ideal weight, but people feel bad when they're overweight. Right. And, and they get this image in their head that if I could lose 50 pounds, I would feel better. So they equate the way that they feel with what they weigh. And what I find so many times is I, I say, well, let, let, listen, let's do this. Let's get you feeling healthy. Let's get your physiology in tune. And then let's see what your weight comes out to be. Because really, as long as you're being aware of visceral fat, axial fat is not as bad. People, once they feel better, you know, they think they want to lose 100 pounds then they lose 40 pounds and they're feeling like a million dollars. They go, you know what? I feel pretty good. I look pretty good. I'm happy. I've lost weight. My husband's happy again. And it's more of an overall global thing that makes people feel that they've got to lose weight. But when they get to the point where they're healthy and vital and active, the focus on that number isn't as profound because they're yeah. higher with healthier. And when they're healthier, but not necessarily as light as they want, they go, no, I'm good now. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, a lot of it has to do with how we feel. And when when we're able to look at ourselves in a different light, you know, plus minus hormones, when we can look at ourselves in a different light, then we can start taking action that is going to give us the results that we want. And so one of the things, you know, I have a program called the Minnow System, and we take women from mental misery to mental mate. So, you know, women who are really bothered by symptoms, hot flashes, you know, sleepless nights, mood disorders, weight gain, those sorts of things. And we move them into, you know, the minnow mate way of living, which is, you know, somebody who doesn't really have any, bo you know, bothered by symptoms. And what we're seeing is we're seeing these massive weight losses, you know, 40, 50 pounds, but it isn't really about the weight loss. Just like you said, it's really about how, how they feel about themselves. And the fact that, you know, once they make these changes, they want to get up and move more. You know, it, it's so funny to see like from the beginning when people are like, oh, I just have to sit on the couch. And then when they start making some of the changes that we recommend, it's like, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm out and I'm active and I'm feeling really good about myself and I don't know where all this energy is coming from and that sort of thing. And, you know, my story is that, you know, I, I all of a sudden I gained like 50 pounds and I went through, you know, I, I'm a doctor, right? So I'm like, what the hell is happening? And I went to, my wife is a doctor. And she's an integrative medicine physician, right? And I'm like, what the hell is happening to me? And she's like, oh, you just got to wait it out. And I'm like, I don't want to wait it out. And it wasn't that bad. I mean, she she did she did give me some advice. We did change our diets and things. So I don't want to I don't want to bash her. But but then I you know I went to a gynecologist and they just wanted to give me hormones. So I took hormones and then I got a period. And I was like, I'm not interested in having periods again. I I didn't have periods on purpose, you know, for a long time. So I was like, this isn't going to work for me. So I kind of spent a lot of time just researching and putting together things that worked for me that I didn't have to take any hormones. And, you know, my, my result is a you know, 50, 60 pound weight loss and I'm still losing. So I had gained a lot after having a baby that I just never lost. And so now that I'm, you know, feeling a lot better after making all these lifestyle changes, all, all I want to do is, you know, share the good news. <laughs> so yeah, no. That's a, that's a remarkable story, but, you know, specifically getting into the hormones, I mean, there's no, no doubt that when you look at hormones and their relationship to disease as we age, there's a direct correlation. I mean, you know, there's a five times increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. There's a, uh, they, you can cut cardiovascular risk by over, over 50% by being hormonally balanced. I mean, you can reduce the risk of breast cancer by elevating testosterone levels. You improve uh, type 2 diabetes. So, I mean, hormones are so beneficial to our overall physiology. 
that, you know, I, you know, when I was learning marketing and things like that, when I was in business school, you know, they say, okay, well, you know, there's riches and niches and what you got to do is, you know, you don't, you can't ever have a product that everybody should be taking. And yet when I look at hormones, I go clearly that is a product that everybody should be taking to optimize their vitality and their wellness as they age. So it's crucial in so many things. I mean, you know, there, there's this big 10,000 person study called the Cash County study on on hormones and the development of Alzheimer's d- dementia, and it, it clearly shows that women that are balanced in hormones have a 80% reduction in the risk of dementia. Now, we spend gazillions of dollars trying to treat dementia. Well, okay, why don't we spend a, a couple of small dollars and prevent 80% of it? And, and then, you know, we have less of a problem to deal with. Uh, and these right. People- I think the body does have the ability to heal itself. And while Balancing hormones is, you know, that's a, that's an industry belief. And, you know, I think that we don't want to discount the fact that, that some people, you know, some women can't take hormones, but they can still get balanced by making lifestyle changes. I don't want to say that everyone should take should take hormones because you don't have to t- necessarily take an exogenous hormone or hormone outside of yourself to experience some sort of transformation. So it's just a matter of, of making some changes. I mean, like me, I didn't want to take any hormones. I mean, I sometimes take testosterone, but I, I forget to put it on and it's just, you know, but that's why you have the pellet, right? That's why I have the pellet. You know, don't, don't get me wrong. I do all of the uh, techniques, okay? I mean, I'm really facile with pellets, creams, injections, whatever it takes. I find people do best on the pellets and that's that's why I, you know, prefer the pellets, but uh, you know, anything, any, you know, people are individuals and some people don't like sticking that thing in their butt every yeah. three months, you know? So, I mean, you know, you got to do what the people want in order to make sure that they're getting the benefits of the treatments that they'd like to have. So when it comes to the pellet, do you formulate it first for them or do you just have pre-formulated pellets? Each individual's dose is individualized. Okay. But what we do in stock is we have the testosterone, we have 12 and a half milligram increments so we can, you know, build them up to whatever dose they need. And similar for estradiol, mix and match to get the, their personalized dose. So it is customized, but they're in pre-formulated pellets that we mix and match to get the doses that we want. And so you create one pellet for the per patient every every three months? Well, it's not necessarily one. I mean, let's say, you know, somebody needs 137 and a half milligrams of testosterone. You might use a 87 and a half and a 50. Or 100 mm-hmm. and then 100, so they would get two, but they, were, they would be getting that. And then, of course, they would need the rest of the dial, so that would be three tiny little pellets about the size of a grain of rice or even much smaller than that. It's inserted through the same kind of device that many women have seen to insert their, uh, their progesterone uh, birth control uh, uh, pellets under the skin in their arm. Same thing. Okay. Do you use an ultrasound machine when you no, put it in? Uh, no, no. I, you know, it's a pretty simple procedure. It's just... A little bit of local anesthetic, tiny little uh, two or three millimeter nick in the skin. The device goes in. The whole thing in women takes about two or three minutes, and for men, maybe three to five minutes. Okay. And you put it in the subcutaneous fat in the buttock? Yep. For women in the buttocks, men, we've just changed to the flank because men get obviously a great deal more hormone, and that flank spot tends to be a little bit more protected and out of the way than the butt, and it allows Mm -hmm. them to get back to to their vigorous athletic activities faster. So would you put, if, if you had a woman who was really vigorously athletic, because a lot of women are vigorously athletic, like me, would you put it in the flank for her? Well, you know, then you get into the cosmetics of it, okay? I mean, you know, I, I would if she had requested it there and understood that there would be a, a visible scar. But I mean, I'm in Orlando and I deal with a lot of Brazilians. And the last thing you want to do with a Brazilian is put a visible scar on, sure. their, on their thong line and they'll about, about have, have your head off. And one of the things that I know my audience is going to want to know is like, what does it cost to get a consultation with you? And then what does it cost for an every three month kind of pellet? Yeah, we try to make it as cost effective as possible. I mean, you know, initial hormone consultation with me for an hour and 15 minute evaluation is $295. And then we build programs uh, based off of a kind of a recurring thing to kind of spread out the cost over the year. So People will pay so much every month so that, you know, there's really nothing there. And for that, you know, they get access to me by phone, by email, by video link, by whatever, pretty much whenever they need an appointment. So once they're in kind of our program, 
There's no fees on a per click basis, which really makes it easy and affordable since we don't do any insurance. Now, every program is going to be a little bit different because everybody needs different things. Are they needing weight management? Do they need, you know, or are they going to do some sexual rejuvenation procedures or whatever? But I would say a basic hormone program is about two to three hundred dollars a month on the lower end from women, on the higher end for men, and then depending upon what else we bolt on on top of that. Mm-hmm. And there are a number of different things that we do to help rejuvenate people. So you have a subscription model? Yes. Okay. So you have a subscription model that's similar to concierge medicine, but it's different because you're not doing primary care, you're doing hormone Exactly. Care. Exactly. All and right. they, 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 you know, they essentially get the same type of concierge. I mean, you know, we, we're very responsive. We touch our patients frequently. And we encourage them to call. I don't want people sitting out there having issues going on that are unaddressed. So we're very mm-hmm. proactive about making sure people call in. And you know how it is. You'd rather have them call you up and deal with a problem when it's simple than sit there not being able to get a hold of you and have to deal with a major problem. That's, or know, show up in the ER unannounced. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah. And it works very yeah. well. So we, we promote that kind of culture. And That's good. Yeah, so they have pretty much unfettered access to you. They'll text you, they'll call you, they'll email you, and they'll be able to get a hold of you. Yep, they get a hold okay. of you. Okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of nice. So, you know, at $300 a month, that includes the drugs as well? It includes, yeah, it, you know, it includes everything. It includes all the hormones, all, you know, for the women, it includes estradiol, mm-hmm. progesterone, and their testosterone. Thyroid is a little bit variable, so that one we usually send out to the pharmacies, but we do use a natural thyroid product, either Nature mm-hmm. Thyroid, NP, or I'm not particularly fond of Armour because uh, it's owned by Noel, also owns Synthroid, and Noel went out and bought about two or three years ago, Noel went around the world and bought all of the pig farms that were making thyroid and shut them down, uh-huh. and so they created a severe shortage in worldwide uh, ingredients for thyroid, Okay. Well, you can't just go to Indonesia and open up a pig farm. You have to open up the farm. You have to make sure that it's healthy. You have to bring the FDA in. The FDA has to prove it. So it took about two years to readjust the thyroid uh, uh, supply chains. It's really an evil, evil thing by big pharma, what they did. Yeah, I had a really hard time with Armour Thyroid. When I changed my diet and I was taking Armour Thyroid, I had, I had, I started getting like palpitations. Yeah, and armor. I got armor, rid. I got rid of it and started taking Synthroid, and it was better. Yeah, armor is a very dirty composition. Okay, and everybody knows it. There's so many byproducts and ingredients mm. in armor that it, it, I, I dislike it for a number of reasons. It, primarily because it's a dirty co- collection, I and mean, when you get into Nature Thyroid or uh, WP Thyroid, they're they're far more cleaned up and reprocessed to where they're more and more just T4 and T3. That's good. Let's just. Briefly, we only have a little bit of time left, but I, let's talk a little bit about sexual rejuvenation. Are you like injecting the G-spot? Is that what you're doing? You're using a little bit of something there? Yeah, well, we use platelet-rich plasma uh, for women, so, and we are licensed O-shot uh, provider. And uh, so basically, and we do use, everybody calls them stem cells, but pretty much true stem cells are not available in the United yeah. States. We're careful. I, I pretty much call it uh, cellular derived growth factors which are further enhanced over platelet-rich plasma. But we do use these two substances and inject uh, the area around the periurethral area and the clitoris. And we get really good responses in terms of improving sexual responsiveness, lubrication, big responses in terms of stress incontinence. We see far better results when it's done in combination with hormone therapy because obviously mm-hmm. that testosterone is going to tighten up those pelvic muscles uh, in and of itself. So, you know, you do that, you do the P, the O shot or, or whatever. And we're also using radio frequency. Uh, that radio frequency is also very good. So I kind of liken it like this. You're stirring up the embers, you know, when you do the hormones, okay? And then when you put the, the O shot in there, it's like squirting a little bit of lighter fluid on top of it. And then when you add the cellular drive growth factors, it's like putting an atom bomb on top of that. So wow. there's multiplying effect as you go through the various processes, okay? And we, we find really, really good results in hormone-balanced women that do the radio frequency that then do either the O-shot or the combined with cellular drive growth factors. So 
when we get platelet rich plasma, that's really just derived from the patient's blood. So you draw the patient's blood, you spin it down, you take the plasma out, and then you use that as injectable. But I'm, I'm sorry, but the thought of a needle in my clitoris is, I mean, I, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, truly, no. <laughs> there are people who will bypass that recommendation, but we, we are very, very good at uh, getting it numbed up. Uh, we use a topical cream to get started, and then okay. we use nerve, nerve block, specific nerve blocks that help create a, a numb environment. So they, while, while probably it wouldn't be the first thing you did on a, you know, in preparation for a Saturday night, it is something that women do do, and that the, the long run does tend to uh, mitigate whatever discomfort. To get Are you blocking the pudendal nerve then? Yes. Okay. Wow. Wow, that's really cool. Well, on that note, how do people get a hold of you? Well, they can reach us at our website, and our website is really, really easy. It's www.hormonesandwellness, all spelled out, so hormonesandwellness.com. And we're in Orlando, Florida, and it's easy to find me, Dr. John Carazella, at the Florida Center for Hormones and Wellness. That's great. Well, John, thanks so much for coming on the Menopause Movement Podcast. This has been great. And if we get a lot of questions, we'll bring you back. I, I think awesome. this is really great. I, I have just for anyone, you know, who was really interested in the sexuality part, remember we've got the power of pleasure with Julia Lolly. And we also had a, a whole session about the jade egg. So that's something else for everyone to listen to. So Dr. John, thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. Did you know that menopause is not a medical condition? Most doctors don't know this either. I like to say that menopause is the privilege of a long life. And to really take hold of our lives in menopause, we have to unlearn what society and the medical establishment has told us about menopause. Thanks so much for being a part of the menopause movement. 